Good morning. Thank you for joining me again for our live webinar. Today's topic, assignment of parental rights to interested third parties. It should basically be parental rights and responsibilities on the interested third parties. If you have any questions regarding family law in general, child custody, divorce, child maintenance, as always, you are welcome to post it on the Advocate Mohammed Abdelal Facebook page, Trust Account Advocate. Otherwise, um, please feel free to listen and if you have any queries later on, if you are watching this video later on, you may leave a comment. I cannot guarantee that I will see the comment or be able to respond to it, but nonetheless, I will try my best. I shall try my best. Assignment of parental rights and responsibilities on third parties. What am I talking about? How do I put you into context? I think that's very important. And once I have done that, we can move forward. Mothers and fathers have parental rights and responsibilities over the kids. Basically, they have the responsibility to maintain the child, to feed the child, to educate the child, to protect the child, to give the child shelter, and so on. So that responsibility is on mothers and fathers. So we accept that. There's nothing we can change about that. A mother will always have the parental rights and responsibilities of guardianship to care for the minor child, um, to consent for the minor child's passport application, to the location, and enrollment into schools and so on. Where the father is concerned, the father will always have an obligation to maintain the minor child, to pay child maintenance. But when it comes to issues, for example, regarding consent or guardianship issues or care and contact issues, that is not necessarily by default. For example, let's say the father does not know the minor child or the minor child does not know the father at all. When the mother was pregnant, the father went missing. He cannot come out of the hoods 10 years later and say, I want to see my child. Now, he can potentially see the child if it is in a minor child's best interest, but by default, he would not have any parental rights and responsibilities of care and contact regarding the minor child. He will, of course, have the obligation to maintain the minor child. So ultimately, we look at what is best for the minor child. Moving forward, how does this specific topic apply to our specific scenario or our specific situation? Or where will I apply it in the first place? Let's say for argument's sake, the mother divorced the father, or the mother and the father are now no longer together, and the mother met some another person, some significant other person in her life. The father is missing, the father is nowhere to be found. Now the specific, this new person, this new partner in her life, they're living with a minor child, um, this partner is very much involved in the minor child's life. And this partner does not necessarily want to adopt a minor child because the father is somewhere there, but he would like to have certain parental rights and responsibility regarding the minor child. For example, he wants to also be consulted regarding the minor child in the loading to schools, passport application, or he wants to travel with the minor child and they might say, where, where is the guardian of the minor child? You know, then where does he come from? He's looking after the child, he's maintaining the child, he's creating a, he has a bond with the minor child. He is basically the father of the minor child, although not biological, and he wants to be assigned certain parental rights over the minor child in terms of a court order. So for him, it makes sense for him to be assigned those parental rights responsibilities. He will have rights of care, contact, guardianship, etc. Alternatively, let's say him and the mother have separated, or they divorce, or, getting, or they are getting divorced. It is still possible under those circumstances for a court to make an order, sir, although you are no longer with the mother of the minor child, you are not, you were not married to the minor child, or, or you are now divorcing the mother of the minor child, you are still allowed to have contact with the minor child and still be in the minor child's life. So here we have a situation where a third party, from a family point of view, would have be would have been assigned parental rights over the minor child. So, although him and the mother have separated or divorced, he still has a right to have contact with the minor child. 
so that's one one typical example where the assignment will be applicable another possible scenario to put you in the loop let's say the mother and the father they separated and the paternal grandparents they want to be involved in the minor child's life but the mother does not want the paternal grandparents the father's parents to be involved in the minor child's life before the party separated the grandparents used to see these minor children every single day they used to pray together go to the beach together have fun together now because the parents the biological parents they have separated or their relationship has come to an end the mother is now saying you know what i am done with your family dad you can see you can have contact with your minor children in terms of whatever rights you have or the mother might refuse the father from having contact whatever her reasons are and she by default of course does not want to allow the paternal grandparents would have of having any contact with a minor child what can those paternal grandparents do yes they can approach the court and they can ask for the assignment of rights of care and contact to the pacific minor children so here we have a scenario where third parties grandparents remember i say third parties because they are no longer they're not the parents of the minor child they induce the third parties they are now assigned by the interrelated responsibilities of key and contact. So it's a interesting scenario, but basically it might entail that on Christmas Day, maybe on the minor children's birthdays or the grandparents' birthdays or once a month or quite often they would have contact, telephonic, video, whatever the case may be. Not maybe as often as a parent would have contact, but they will be part of the minor child's life. So where does the law come in? What law applies? Of course, if you were if you were watching the screen, you would have seen section 23 of the Children's Act. And let me just go to the top. So what law am I looking at? I'm looking at the Children's Act. Children's Act number 38 of 2015. If you are dealing with a family law matter, I would advise you to study this act and apply your mind to this act. Now we have to get back to section 23. That's 28. So we'll deal with the following two scenarios. We'll deal with the issue of assignment of contact and care to interested third parties by order of court. And then we'll go further to the assignment of guardianship rights by an order of court. So let's start with section 23. What does section 23 say? Assignment of contact and care to interested third parties, sorry, interested person by order of court. Any person having an interest in the care, well being, or development of a child may apply to the High Court. So, a High Court would be, for example, the grandmother. A divorce court, in divorce matters, you are dealing with a stepfather, for example. Or the children's court, so the children's court might be the grandparents or any other third parties, or the boyfriend. For an order granting the applicant, here we refer to the grandparents or the boyfriend or the ex-husband, on such conditions as a court may deem necessary, a contact with the child, a the law says it's possible, b care and Care of the child, here you will have custody of the child, you will look you will look after the child. It will basically be your child. Let me just move this thing a bit further down. When considering an application contemplated in subsection one, the court must take into account the best interest of the child. That is a given. The court will never make an order which is not in the minor child's best interest. The relationship between the applicant and the child and any other relevant person and the child. So here we're dealing with various people. That is one of the factors the court must consider. It is possible for an aunt 
that never met the minor child, but because the mother passed away and the father was missing, for that on to apply for this card for this key and contact rights. Despite there not having been any relationship, or a neighbor as well, if you are interested and the court believes it is in a minor child's best interest. The degree of commitment that the applicant has shown towards the child is only one factor. The extent to which the applicant has contributed towards expenses in connection with the birth and maintenance of the child. Very interesting there. That might not apply to many cases. Might apply to a stepdad. Any other fact that should, in the opinion of the court, be taken into account. Very important. Various factors the court has to look at. What generally happens is in this legislation, the court or the person that drafted, sorry, the person that drafted this legislation, he or she would outline some factors to assist us and guide us in moving forward. But ultimately, there can be a host of factors to look and consider. Subsection 3. If in the course of the court proceedings, it is brought to the attention of the court that an application for the adoption of the child has been made by another applicant, the court must request a family advocate, social worker or psychologist to furnish it with a report and the recommendations as to what is in the best interest of the child and may suspend the first mentioned application on any condition it may determine. So it seems to me that there are generally, or sometimes, not generally, sorry, sometimes there may be a situation where one party wants to acquire parental rights and responsibilities over the minor child and other parties wants to adopt the minor child. So that could be in conflict. So here we're dealing with a situation where the, where the legislature dealt with that issue and said, get the family advocate on board and potentially suspend the application for the assignment of key and contact rights. And subsection 4, the granting of key or contact to a person in terms of the section does not affect the parental responsibilities and rights that any other person may have in respect of this the same child. So what are they saying? What is the legislation saying? It's saying basically, if we afford the grandmother certain contact rights, it does not take any of the father's rights away or the mother's rights away. Technically, it does maybe in practice because now it means that the parents, them, they, they will not exercise cumulatively 100% contact with a minor child. Here we have another third party that might take 10% away. But nonetheless, nonetheless, this is what the law says. But I think they're referring here basically to the issue concerning guardianship rights and so on. So if they do give the grandmother certain parental rights and responsibilities of key and contact, it does not mean that the father's right of guardianship or his right to see or have contact with a minor child falls away. So that was really interesting, a good exercise for me as well. It assists me in applying my mind. Um, should someone walk through my door tomorrow with a specific scenario, I would offer the fresh it. And you as well. Assignment of guardianship by order of court. Okay, very important, interesting topic. Guardianship is not key in contact. It's very important to note that. Guardianship applies to legal aspects of a minor child's life. I mention it a lot. If you never watch any of my previous videos, a parent may have no rights of care and contact. He or she is not allowed to see the child or even, com even communicate with a minor child. But it is possible for that parent to have rights of guardianship over the minor child. So how does that work? Guardianship applies to legal aspects of a minor child's life in, in layman terms. For example, when the minor child wants to enroll into a school, nothing to do with contact, apply for a passport, visit a different country, leaving South Africa, go for an operation, purchase a um, certain example, a house, um, institute legal proceedings and so on, the guardian's consent must be obtained. Nothing to do with key and contact. Therefore, it's important to understand that custody and guardianship are two separate issues and they can be dealt with separately. 
And with a, in the same place, in the same scenario, it's possible for, and I'll use the stereotype example, it's possible for a mother to have sole custody over the minor child, whereby she decides on the day-to-day -day activities of the minor child, caring for the minor child, and so on, but she has very limited, or maybe no guardianship rights over the minor child. So, for argument's sake, should the minor child want to enroll into school, the father's consent is only required, despite the father not being able to see the child. It could be because the mother has certain uh, challenges. We can be creative and think of some of them. Um, alternatively, the court may be determined that the mother might be making a lot of irresponsible decisions regarding the minor child, and we can have the father make those decisions, but the father cannot have contact with the minor child. These are all fictitious, fictitious examples, but obviously for me to bring um, the point home and across. So, Section 24 will deal with a situation where a third party, and let's say, for example, in my example here, the stepfather, the stepfather, the father, the biological father of the minor child passed away. This is a simple example. He passed away. A gentleman came and he married the mother of the minor child. He is a stepfather. He has no link, family link with the minor child. Any decision regarding that specific minor child is made only by the mother because she is the remaining guardian over the minor child. As I mentioned earlier, the father passed away. But we have this another year where the mother travels the world. She, she has to work, she goes overseas quite often. And the stepfather is left in South Africa to care for this minor child, make decisions for this minor child, but he is not a guardian. Problems could arise. Now they have to apply for documentation, for enrollment into schools and you, your guess is as good as mine, and problems arise because he's not the guardian of the minor child, but he's caring for the minor child. Under those specific circumstances, it makes logical sense for him to apply to court and for the court to assign guardianship rights onto him. That makes logical sense to me. I would actually advise him to do that to avoid certain problems in the future from arising, seeing that the mother is not always available. Or even if the mother is available, but because this gentleman was always the minor child's life, since birth basically, when the father went missing, the father passed away. He does not want to adopt a minor child because he feels he's not his, but he's his biological child. Or, sorry, if it was his biological child, there would not have been a need to adopt. But nonetheless, he wants to be assigned these specific parental rights and responsibilities. Alternatively, he's not married to the mother and so on. That would be a perfect example whereby somebody would apply for the assignment of guardianship rights over the minor child. In the same way, for example, let's say mother and dad. Mom and dad, they are alcoholics, they are drug addicts, they are in rehab all the time, father might be in prison, and grandmother or aunt is now keen for the specific minor child. They came for the minor child. But that's problematic because the parents are nowhere to, nowhere to be found. They only come home to the grandparents for money and they continue with their lives and they leave the minor child behind or children behind. Here the grandparents or the aunt has the challenge of always convincing the preschool, the primary school that, you know, the parents are nowhere to be found. We are the grandparents, we are keen for the minor children. And the, and the school might say, you know, ma'am, we cannot assist you because we require the parent parental consent. Under those circumstances, it, it might make sense for the grandparents to be assigned guardianship rights. So those are the two examples I dealt with, and it does unpack it a bit further. Section 24, assignment of guardianship by order of court. Any person having an interest in the care, well-being, and development of a child may apply to the high court for an order granting guardianship of the child to the applicant. Now, very important, if you didn't pick it up, High Court. It does not mention Children's Court, Divorce Court, and any other court there may be. It only refers to the High Court. So only the High Court can deal with the issue concerning guardianship rights. The assignment they are, at least. Subsection 2. When considering an application contemplated in Subsection 1, the court must take into account 
the best interest of the child. We know that. Number B, or point B, the relationship between the applicant and the child and any other relevant person and the child, yes, and any other fact that should, in the opinion of the court, be taken into account. So basically the court is saying holistically, we look at all factors here, and ultimately what would be in the minor child's best interest. And the third point, in the event of a person applying for guardianship, of a child that already has a guardian. The applicant must submit the reasons as to why the child's existing guardian is not suited to be have guardianship in respect of the child. So basically what you're stipulating here, my scenario, here is already a guardian, the mother, she's already the guardian of the minor child, and the father, my logical father, passed away. So here we have a scenario where the stepdad wants to be appointed as guardian over the minor child, but the child has a guardian, a mother. So he'll have, he'll have to give really good reasons why um, he would want to be a guardian or why the existing guardian, guardian is not a suitable to have guardianship in respect of the minor child. Okay, the section is a bit complicated. It might not be specific with our scenario, but at the end of the day, the court will have to determine is it in the minor child's best interest for the specific party to be appointed as guardian and the court is not really much limited by potential of having a different scenario. The scenario in subsection C might apply for argument's sake whereby the grandparents are saying that these parents cannot properly care for these minor children and therefore they are not suitable for that and therefore assign guardianship rights to us. That is it. I do not see any comments on our Facebook page. Uh, this topic is not much one to discuss. It's more sometimes an issue of interest than something that's really uh, prevalent um, out there, but nonetheless, it is something of interest to me and to quite a few of my clients that come to me at least maybe every second or third month, somebody comes to me with a specific scenario of assignment of guardianship rights or care rights of a minor child to them. Thank you very much for watching. Um, it's always good to have um, people watching these videos, and while I'm watching these videos, I can see the amount of people tuning in, so it's always appreciated. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day.